Hello, I am Stephen Edholm from SkillCult.com and today we're talking about acorns. This is a video two this fall about acorns. The first one was me picking up acorns, talking about questions, myths, and just kind of generalities, picking up uh, storing, drying, and stuff like that. Today we're going to talk about processing acorns and I'm not going to actually go through the process uh, here, but don't think that that means that this video isn't going to be useful. This is sort of a primer to get you on to that next step and I'm going to give you some excellent resources, books, and videos to check out to uh, take that next step. Whether I'll actually ever make a acorn processing video is kind of up in the air but I'm not going to pull it off this fall for sure. I think it's pretty common knowledge now that acorns are bitter and you have to process them before you eat them. The bitter principle is tannic acid. It's not really poisonous. It's just really bitter unless you eat huge quantities of it. It's water soluble so you basically use water to carry that tannic acid away. Similar to making coffee except that you're eating the grounds uh, and the coffee you're throwing away. Now through the eons, over the broad span of time, people all over the world, different cultures have eaten acorns. And I'm sure there's a lot of different ways that they were processed. Sometimes they're processed whole, sometimes they're processed green, sometimes dried, sometimes made into a flower. The most sophisticated and interesting processes I know of come from the California Indian cultures who use this as a staple food. Now California had a huge native population and that was made possible by acorns and having access to this awesome year-round staple food supply. They're high in carbohydrates, fats, they have quite a bit of protein, they're just all around a pretty good staple food and the fact that you can store them in large quantities over a long period of time, even over, you know, through a, a lean year if you gather enough of them, makes them uh, just incredibly valuable food. If you're looking at acorns from the perspective of like a prepper, survivalist, or just even a hardcore back to the land, food self-reliance type of person, you need to know about this. So the lineage of information that has come down to me comes through California native culture. There's going to be variation, you know, from group to group, but there are going to be some commonalities and there's kind of, you know, break it down to sort of a typical process that you would go through. So for this process, you're going to want to dry the acorns in the shell and store them in the shell. Modern processes often use fresh acorns. Uh, for instance, there's a book called Acorns and Eat em, where she promotes the idea of putting the fresh meats in water in the refrigerator and then changing the water every day and then eventually they become sweet and you can use them. Obviously, if you're trying to use this as a year-round staple, that doesn't, you know, really work. You'd have to freeze them or something like that. So if you're serious about learning to use this as a staple food, whether you're going to actually do it or not, but you just want that knowledge, then you want to learn a process where you can store them for a long period of time and then process them dry. So the dry acorns are cracked open. You just set them on a, a rock with a point down and hit them and especially when they're dry they crack real easy. If there's a second skin on the outside here, like on some types it just falls off real easy, but if that sticks, uh, something I learned from Julia Parker who wrote this book I'll talk about in a minute, is to get the acorns wet and then you know just sprinkle them with water and get that skin wet, you don't soak them or anything, and then dry them in the sun and that skin lifts right off. Great tip, I'm so glad I learned that from her because if you have to sit around and kind of like cut that off with a knife it's just super super tedious. So once you have a bunch of dry meats they are pounded and that's done in a mortar with a pestle, usually a large stone pestle. I made this one. It's kind of oval shaped and I was thinking about making it round but I actually like the weight of this and I don't really want it to get any lighter. Now you don't need a fancy pestle like this. I've also used just you know large roughly you know long pestle shaped rocks. The mortar was often a large stone bowl like these are big stone bowls sometimes uh, they could be you know 40 60 pounds sometimes but there's another cool technology this is called a hopper basket and you can see it has no bottom here and this is set onto a flat rock and you hold this down with your legs and just pound the acorn in here on the bottom because you're never hitting the basket right. Now there's, when you're pounding, there's always a layer of acorn here, so you're never hitting the rock against the rock. Like, you don't want to hear rock hitting rock at all. That's pretty easy to do as long as you have enough acorn in there, and you just keep pushing the unbroken pieces in, in the middle, and it sort of, as you hit it, the, the meal spreads out, and then it falls back down, like kind of a cycle like this. So the advantage to this in terms of portability is obvious. These are cultures that would often move around 
quite a bit, right? It's not like people were just wandering through the wilderness picking up food or anything like that. Village sites were basically permanent, but you might go into the mountains to collect something, acorn collecting trip or anything, or hunting and stuff like that. In which case you'd want to carry your household essentially with you, like the household essentials. So with this process, there's a whole bunch of things that go with the process, different baskets and stuff like that. You could take all the baskets, nest them together, put them in here and carry them to the next site. And then if this is a place that you go to often, you'd already have a flat rock there, or maybe a pestle stash too, you're, you're in business, right? So you'll notice a lot of native basket styles are quite lightweight. This is actually on the heavy side because I wanted it to be really stiff, so I, I made it actually extra beefy like these lines right here have sticks laid inside the weaving to give this more rigidity but typically a lot of the baskets are extremely light and extremely thin you can nest them all together set them in here and go so this basket for instance is very very light in weight and I could make the same basket more durable and heavy with more of this kind of a weaving. This is like whole willow shoots, and so is this. This is just smaller willow shoots. This is adapted to like a sedentary lifestyle. I'm here on my homestead. You know, I'm, I use this around here. I might throw it in my car and drive it to town, but I don't have to hike it to town 10 miles, let alone hike, you know, eight or 10 baskets like this. So the native basket styles are adapted for this, you know, mobility. So as the meal is pounded in here, it becomes finer and finer, and you want to end up with a really fine flour, but you hit a point of diminishing returns where you're pounding, but you're not doing as much work because there's so much fine flour in already that it kind of just cushions everything. So at some point, you're gonna take that stuff out, you're gonna sift all of it, and then you're gonna put the coarse pieces back. Now, when I say sifting, you're gonna think probably of something with holes in it, like a screen and you shake it and the, stu the fine stuff falls through. This is uh, quite different. So this kind of sifting, uses a basket that's usually flattish. The meal is put in there and it's basically tossed or, or agitated and the coarse stuff falls away and the finest stuff sticks to the basket. And then you toss the uh, coarse stuff off the side and then, and then repound it. So eventually through this process, you end up with a bunch of fine meal stuck here. You keep saving that. You repound the, the coarse stuff, sift it again, etc. Now you do need to get it really fine, but you don't want it perfectly silky. Like being a total perfectionist <laughs> sometimes about certain things. Uh, when I first started doing this and didn't really have good instruction, I made it too fine and the water wouldn't leach through the meal because it was so fine it was just like clogging up and it wouldn't filter out. So I, I asked a friend about it and she was like, oh no, you're, you're making it too fine. You need to do just a little bit of texture in there and that, that turns out to be true. So this is a difficult process to learn and you basically kind of tilt the basket. What I do is I, I kind of toss it in this circular motion. Other times it's, it's kind of tapped or tapped with a stick and it's hard to do. Like if I showed it to someone and handed them a basket, the average person w would have a hard time learning it. Um, but I, I can't really say much more about that right now. But anyway, you need to get the, the flour pretty fine. Now, could you use a screen sifter? I don't know that I've tried, uh, but I, you probably could if you had a fine enough one. I don't see why not. I think it just needs to be really fine. So now we have meal, but the meal is still bitter. So the typical process was to take a large mound of coarse sand, flatten it off into a big flat topped, you know, kind of cone thing, carve a basin into it, and then line that basin with fine sand. The acorn meal was placed in there on the damp, wet sand, like it's formed really, really carefully, and right on the sand, and spread out, and then the water's poured on. I tried it once with just the straight sand like that. It was a total disaster. I got my acorn meal, got all full of sand. Fortunately, there's a way to fix that. You can just add it to water and mix it around and the sand drops right to the bottom and you pour off the, the water with the acorn meal mixed in it. And do that a couple of times, you can get all of the sand out. So if you ever want to try that process, don't be afraid to try it because you can uh, remediate the, pro the thing. So that meal is spread out really flat into a thin layer, not, not a really thick layer and you add water to it, you let the water go through, you add more, it goes through, and you just keep doing that until it's sweet. So 
Some acorns are more bitter than others, and a lot of the processes, especially say for like tan oak, this one here, which is uh, one of the more bitter ones, you'll use warm water for that process. Don't use water that's so hot that it'll cook it, for sure, because it'll stop the leaching. It'll, it'll like cook and swell the acorn and make it into like a gel almost. Just get started with the cold water and get going and then start adding some warm water. So let it drain all the way after you've done that for a while. Taste it, and if it's uh, sweet and no longer bitter, you're good to go. Now that was typically made into either some kind of a, a bread-like loaf thing or a soup or what we call a mush or, or like a hot cereal type of thing. For the breads, they're typically wrapped in leaves. So green leaves, like say around here, I would probably go find some maple or wild grape. Put a bunch of layers of leaves over the dough, wrap it up and tie it with something and then set it into a hot pit oven. So this is just like a a hole in the ground, you build a fire in it for a while, maybe have some hot rocks in there, set the stuff in, cover it back over, build a fire on top, and then dig it up later, and you have these clean loaves inside of, you know, baked inside of the leaves. There's also a video I'll tell you about that I saw recently where the lady's just cooking them on like a hot rock next to the fire. Now probably the most typical thing was to make this uh, type of uh, acorn soup, so that was made in a large basket. They're obviously watertight if you're cooking liquids in them, but anyway, the way you cook in those baskets is to heat rocks. So you heat rocks in the fire and then you dip them in water to rinse them off real quick, throw them in the basket, and the heat transfers really quickly to the liquid. I mean, they cook things super, super fast because there's no, none of this inefficiency of having like the flame underneath the pot that has to go through the metal of the pot and some of it goes and escapes around the outside and then it has to go into the liquid. It's like direct contact and the stuff will boil just super, super fast. Now, the rock doesn't burn the basket because the basket's full of liquid. So you don't wanna take a super red hot rock, like glowing red, drop it in there and just walk away. Um, but you know, if you drop it in there and just kind of move it around a little bit, it's fine and it doesn't hurt the basket. Obviously that process is a kind of fuel inefficient because you have to use a lot of fuel to get those, those rocks hot. But once they're hot, they cook stuff really, really fast. So that's kind of a typical process. And it's not like these ladies uh, get up every day and do this all over again. It's done in batches, just like it'd be the equivalent of having a baking day where you bake you know, goods for the week or for a half a week at a time. Okay, let's talk about a few resources where you can go and take this information and start to put it into practice. Number one is Julia Parker's It Will Live Forever. Uh, if you're at all serious about acorns or want to know about this, get this book. I'll put a link in the description. I've had the privilege of knowing Julia for many years. We taught at the same places quite a bit. Her and her daughter Lucy teach classes in native foods and basketry. If you ever get a chance to take any of those, uh, don't hesitate to do it. Julia and Lucy are what I would call cultural ambassadors. They're out there putting forth the culture of native California and saying this this is who we are in opposition to like the typical stereotypes watching movies and stuff like that you get this idea that Indians are on horses with headdresses living in teepees right but there's so many different cultures and uh, these are the people that get out there and kind of show who they are as a culture just get it this is a pretty neat book that you can read online for free. There's quite a bit of stuff about oaks and acorns. If you live in California, especially Northern California, you need to have this book uh, if you're interested in plants and uh, their uses. There's also some really great videos. There are two by the University of California, Berkeley in the late 50s or early 60s. One is a lady processing acorns for like the soup, and then another one is making bread. Those videos are really, really cool. Um, I've been a trying to show those to people for decades now. Um, so with the digital age and YouTube and stuff, you can actually find these things and watch them. So I'll put links in the description for those if I can find them. Of course, with online videos, they kind of disappear and reappear and stuff like that, but I'll give you as much information as I can to help you try to find them. And I also just found another one recently that someone published of a lady in the Yosemite Valley processing acorns. Uh, it's a silent film from 1933, I think. Really cool. Uh, and these videos are, they, I think they have a general interest value too, not just, you know, aside from the how-to stuff. It's not just the process, but just to watch these people work and, you know, get a sense of who these women are. Okay, that's it for now. Hopefully you're more informed about uh, acorns than you were when you started this video.